grateful that Joe any six weeks of that. My grandfather, through his connections, found out the Beatles were going to be here when I was, and he began to get me tickets to the freedom, and I'll never forget it. I was so excited. But, I mean, it's pretty far away. We were in the back, but we were near the speakers, too. And I remember my dad was, didn't want to take me. I you know, didn't like rock and roll or the Beatles. And he and a friend of his and his daughter and I went to the show, and we were sitting there screaming our lungs out. I had no voice when I got home. And my dad and my, his friend were sitting there holding their hands over their ears. And, just, and we didn't even realize they were there. We were just oblivious. It was great. Twelve and a half. Going on 13. <laughs> No doubt there were some that grew out of their obsession with the Beatles, but their place in line is quickly filled by new converts, many of whom were barely old enough to crawl when the Fab Four appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show. That regeneration of kids involved in the Beatles. Yeah, I'm sure we do these shows, and they would keep us in business, I'd say, at least, in this year, probably about half that business would be people under 25 that never seen the Beatles. Nothing brought more attention to the Beatles than their first feature film, A Hard Day's Night. For the public, the film was a glimpse into stardom. There was no real plot, just a day in the life format with the Beatles going through the routines of their daily life, playing concerts, dodging fans, and dueling with reporters. The film took place in London's Piccadilly Circus. Mobs of fans were invited to give the movie a real-life look. Shooting began July 6, 1964. United Artists wasn't all that interested in the content of the film. What they really wanted, and got, was the rights to the soundtrack. Just as long as the Beatles' images were on screen and they owned the rights to all the music, United Artists could begin cashing in on the extraordinary album sales. However, the movie turned out to be more than most expected. Under the guidance of Walter Shenson and director Richard Lester, A Hard Day's Night became a powerful classic still studied by film classes everywhere. Oh, I have something here for his makeup. A production schedule is made to be followed, and even the Beatles have to stick to a time table. They pack themselves off to the afternoon location where the second crew is getting ready for them. There probably isn't anyone in the world who hasn't heard of La Scala Opera House. Here is that famous theater. Only this one is not in Milan. It's in London, and playing host to another mob, a movie company, and the inevitable Beatles. <laughs> Somehow, the four whimsical wonders have been sneaked past the waiting crowds and enjoy a few moments of relative peace. To prove that wonders never cease, producer Walter Jensen corralled 1,500 youngsters to fill the seats and make believe they're enjoying themselves. An accomplishment soon to get almost out of hand when the big scene starts on stage. And here's the Beatles, the universal cue for mass mayhem. They're going to treat the audience to some of the 11 songs that will be heard in a hot day's night. Much of the film's charm lay in its cinema verite style of handheld cameras and frenzied cutting. Help, on the other hand, was a surreal parody. Help was the Beatles' second film. The movie showed our heroes in distress, in ridiculous comical situations. The audience was asked over and over, will they survive? Help used many expensive gimmicks that were so popular at the time in movies such as Goldfinger and Thunderball. I need somebody else, not just anybody else. No, I need someone else. Due to the success of A Hard Day's Night, Shenson and Lester were again recruited as producer and director, and United Artists put up the money. But this time, the budget 
was twice that of a hard day's night. An estimated million and a quarter, which by today's standards is virtually nothing. And help made ten times that amount almost as soon as it was released. The Beatles were such a national institution by this time that London's national newspapers devoted the front page that day to pictures of the Beatles and reviews of the film. Unlike the Beatles' first two films, Magical Mystery Tour was a one-hour television special aired in England. It was made from several skits which the Beatles helped write. <laughs> Take a trip back in time with the Beatles. This is a time would never be the same. Well, of course not. It's the same, but I'll forget the boy. Come on, we're going to stay forever. Take your way. Join your old friends. Come back. Let them take you away on a magical mystery tour. Unlike Hard Day's Night and Help, the idea for Yellow Submarine came from a Beatle. According to producer Al Brodax, the film was inspired by a 3 a.m. phone call from Lennon, who said wouldn't it be great if Ringo was followed down the street by a Yellow Submarine. But as things ended up, the Beatles' contribution to their feature was minimal. They did appear briefly near the end and produced the soundtrack featuring cuts from Magical Mystery Tour and Lady Madonna. Brodak said he took a lot from the Sgt. Pepper album. He said, we took the word pepper, which is positive, spicy, and created a place called Pepperland, which is full of color and music. But in the hills surrounding Pepperland lived the Blue Meanies, who hate color and everything positive. Yellow Submarine was assembled under the supervision of German poster artist Heinz Edelman. It was put together from five million separate sketches, which later sold as one-of-a-kind souvenirs. Collectors could actually own the images created for the film. Let It Be was the Beatles' last film together. It was shot in a studio while creating the album Let It Be. The Beatles live in a new motion picture. <laughs> 